All right, cool. Let me just get everyone's attention. Okay, everybody, I think we're going to get started. It's uh, exactly 1.30, so in the interest of making sure this afternoon runs to time, um, if you could take your seats. Hope you enjoyed your lunch and a little bit of our Californian sunshine uh, and uh, are stocked up on fresh coffee. So uh, who loves regex? Who hates regex? Same hands, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Want to dive into regex uh, in D? Yes, okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna hand over to Dimitri, who's gonna do just that. Okay, uh, good day everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your meals because we we're going somewhat deep technically. Uh, well, my name is Dmitry Ashansky, as you all see, and I've been contributing to D since around 2011. And one of my first and maybe the most famous contribution is these regular expressions. And today I'm going to talk about what it is from a developer perspective. So here's a brief outline of our talk. I'm going to start with something like five minute introduction to what regular expressions are, but I know a lot of people know what it is, so we probably skim it a little bit faster. Then I'm talking about how uh, the regex patterns are represented in the libraries, then some fundamental ways of matching stuff, and some discussion of what people do to make them fa work faster. And then we are going to drill <coughs> down deep into these specific things like you know, unique features, what makes it better and what not. And of course, I'm going to show up some future directions, some crazy stuff I planned. OK, <coughs> so regular expressions, uh, for the purpose of this talk, they are domain-specific language for defining patterns. Patterns, in turn, define a set of strings. This is a way to look at them, a simple way. I think uh, a lot of books, uh, let's say, uh, somewhat counterintuitive because they start with matching. I think it's better to look at regular expression at fundamentally as generators. So here's a couple of, let's say, elements that we use and some operators on the right. And you'll note that uh, concatenation is implicit operator. And then that's a fixed string with just a reject pattern that substitutes itself. And you can nest these operators, and we'll see in a couple of slides how this works, how we generate the strings out to that. And the algorithm is pretty simple. So you start with a pattern, uh, you pick any operator, and you do a substitution. You either expand, or in case of star, you shrink it. So let's see how we walk through some examples, like, say, what I call a dramatic stand mean generator. So uh, to understand this mess, uh, blue arrows means we choose to expand star. Red, red arrows choose, means we choose to collapse. And uh, I think it's teal color, right? It is the new stuff that we just expanded. So we start with an exclamation mark, and we do expansion on it a couple of times. Then we choose to collapse it, and then we ch choose the, the first larger group, and then we expand it one time and then we expand it another time, then we choose to collapse it, and we keep going step by step, so we expand a, another null group, and so on. S one of it we expand two times, one, one time, and by the end there is nothing to expand, so we get uh, our statements, oh no, oh no, no, no. Well, not quite dramatic, but maybe, you know, we can generate a lot more with this stuff. <laughs> Okay, some implications. Uh, you know, people get excited about regular expressions, and what they uh, soon come uh, come upon is that you can't represent certain stuff with regular expressions. So, most notably, you can't represent balance parent parents problem. Uh, if you recall the algorithm that we just seen a couple of slides back, that you pick any operator and you do it one step at a time. So, there is no way to make them go in log steps. So, there is no constraints between operators. You can choose whichever one you want and expand it independently. Uh, the simple consequence is that concatenation of patterns is a set of concatenations, and that what makes a regular expression simple and usable. So you compose it out of pieces that you know what they're doing. And star star is a star, so some people expect it to somehow be more powerful. So <laughs> here's an example. Okay, uh, so much about regular expressions and how they generate strings or how they represent strings. And let's talk about actually matching stuff. Uh, there are fundamentally three ways about regular expressions. And 
first two are sort of academical results. They have been known since around 60s, 70s. Uh, the later one is more fashionable ways. Way, and uh, before you think that it's somehow stupid, given the worst case time complexities, well, it's a worst case complexity, right? So it's not always like that. It depends on patterns, so people are not that. <laughs> uh, and by the way, here are the users of these techniques. So the first one is popular only in, say, lexers and some special tools that I know exactly what they're working on. Because as for general tool, you can't uh, deal with this kind of memory blow up. And most importantly, DFA don't have, uh, let's say, it gives you too little information. So it says, OK, it matched, and it ends right there. And that's all. So the NFA are more amendable to some extensions. And lastly, but most importantly, is that you can do a lot of extensions on backtracking and NFAs. We will see it later. Uh, so speaking of uh, how exactly we represent regular expression in standard in libraries, uh, the, uh, the popular approach is uh, so-called uh, virtual machine approach. So regular expression patterns are tran get, getting translated to a special program. And uh, each uh, element of a pattern belongs to a certain code. So it's a very simple VM machine. It doesn't have registers. It doesn't have uh, a stack. It just keeps going. And for our purposes, there's only two state variables, uh, position in text and uh, position in the program. So here are some uh, simple examples of how we rewrite pieces of regular expressions. So concatenation is simply sequential pieces of code. Alternatives get turned into switches, just like switches in a normal program get translated. And uh, star, clean star, gets translated to a sort of loop. It's not quite a normal loop. It's a loop where you have to go both ways. So it's a fork loop of sorts. And some extensions that I'm not going to talk about today, they are covered by special instructions, like group stars or any and you know, end of line, some assertions, zero width, and whatnot. OK, and <clears throat> let's finally get dirty and uh, dive deep into the machines and how they execute the code. So here's a kind of uh, debugger for our VM. It has, uh, OK, the, let's say, code view and uh, pattern view. So we can, oh, what was that? Anyway. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, the blue circle indicates the threads as they stay at the beginning of the program and the beginning of the text. And the uh, bottom, uh, bottom box is uh, for threads that are still to execute. It. We'll see it later. So let's probably step one, one time. So we matched character H and we move on. Matched character I using the extractions. And then we match the character uh, comma. And there's something interesting. So we encountered a loop. Uh, it's not a simple loop, so we get inside and we also spawn a thread outside of the loop. And we keep going like that. Again, we, end, we just hit the end of the loop. We go inside and we spawn another thread outside. And we keep going like that, spinning till the end of text. And finally, uh, character set a, a, dot a dash z doesn't match an exclamation mark, so thread dies. But we have a lot of threads stashed away, so we pick the latest one and try to execute. So it matches the exclamation mark. We move inside, and this is the end, so we found the match. So what we just do? Uh, what we just do it was... Uh, so-called backtracking. So we execute threads in uh, a defrost manner. Uh, every time there is an opportunity to, say, uh, uh, go one way or another way, an alternative or maybe a clean star, we save this to the stack. And then later on, if the current thread fails, we pick the latest one and move on. And uh, this is exactly what Henry Spencer did back in 1991, maybe. Uh, and of course, there's a certain problem with this. And let's see what kind of uh, patterns lead to these problems. So 
as long as uh, as long as pattern isn't ambiguous, everything is quite fine. But let's look at the pattern that is slightly ambiguous. So there's two character sets, and one of them is uh, let's say strict superset of the first one, right? And let's see how it moves on. Well, the ambiguity here is that uh, you don't know b uh, uh, beforehand which part of expression will match the first character set or which the second one. Okay, let's spin on the first loop, and we see that we spawn a lot of threads out of the loop, outside of the loop, until we hit the dead end. Okay, so we pick the last thread and move into the second loop. And we do the same stuff, so we keep spinning until the end of the text and spawning threads outside. All of them die because there's no character Z. That was the point. That's how we make the thing exhaustive. Okay, we pick the seventh thread and move on. Okay, we spawn again we spawn a thread at each iteration of the loop. And all the threads are can again fail. It's easy to see that we are getting not linear behavior but rather quadratic behavior. And it gets worse with, with let's say worse patterns. This is what I call uh, a dark side of backtracking. <laughs> So as long as your pattern has certain ambiguity to it, and that you don't know which way to go at each uh, alternation or maybe linear star, uh, infinite loop. Uh, <coughs> and what we want, what we want to do, is to have something that has linear complexity. And uh, in order to do that, we have to uh, stop executing equivalent threads. So. We must save in a, say, um, kind of dynamic programming way which, which uh, threads we already seen to avoid them. But for backtracking, that means that since we have two state variables, one is program counter, one is position and text, so the total state space is nm. And uh, to avoid that, there is a trick. Uh, what if we schedule threads in such a way that we go uh, sort of way front style? So uh, we pick each thread, we spin, uh, we move it along for one character, and we stop it. Then we take all threads it's spawned, move it one character ahead, and then again we stop it. And do all like all this. Uh, we do it in this way uh, until the next step. So each. Okay. <coughs> so let's try the same pattern, but now we execute friends differently. And you see that we also don't have thread stack, so there is nothing to save. We're going, to, we're going to execute all threads as they have, as they happen. Okay, so we fork, and we have uh, uh, one thread inside of the loop and one thread outside of the loop. So let's execute the first one until we use this one character. Okay, so it's get to the end of loop, and we took the second one and start executing it. The second one spawns the third thread that sits at character Z instruction and it always will fail because there is no such character and let's run it the second thread this time okay we run it inside of the loop it spawns wait, wait a second okay this is the second thread this is, uh, it stops at this position so we made one step with all threads and uh, as you can see, that we advanced both threads along the text at one, by one character. Now let's uh, execute the second step. So we again spin on the first thread inside of the loop. It spawns another thread, number four, third date. Uh, now we know that both second and fourth thread are equivalent because they sit at the same exact position in the program. So we can drop the fourth thread to avoid executing it and move to the second one. So this is still the second step. Uh, the second thread sp uh, spawns the fifth thread, and, and it dies because there is no character Z. So what do we have after the second step? We have two threads sitting in the same positions as before. And bottom line is that we execute all these four threads at each step and this is linear complexity. Okay, to summarize on what you just seen, uh, 
the virtual machine approach allows us to express two kinds of uh, matching engines. One is backtracking, another one is breath first or so-called Thompson machine. Now, breath first is uh, very predictable. It uh, has guaranteed time complexity, but it's a bit tricky to implement. Uh, and the tricky point is merging the threads, like, like we just seen. It's easy to say that threads are equivalent, but it takes a bit of programming to actually figure out this stuff you know, kind of data structure to keep track of which thread stays where at each step. And uh, lastly, that to get from matching to searching, you can just spawn the thread at each step at the beginning of program, and uh, you'll get your string search for free. And, and in case of breath first search, it's exactly free. OK, now uh, somebody may be wondering, what about performance? Uh, virtual machines uh, execution of uh, virtual machine program must be slow. Uh, so what do you think? What is faster? Searching a string and text using some fixed string search, let's say str, str, and maybe spinning on a loop inside of a loop uh, looking for matches. OK, I decided not to guess, but just time this thing. Uh, so here's a couple of uh, implementations I decided to throw in. Some is a simple uh, C library search, so basically mem mem. This is a yellow bar, and the red bar is standard D library search. And by the way, I have no idea if it's slower than this one. And the blue, part, uh, blue bar is a D standard library rejects, and the green bar is a boost C++ rejects which is somehow the slowest one. Uh, it's kind of undecidable, right? Why the regular expression has to be, uh, why is the regular expression are on par with uh, generic search? Oh, and why boost C++ rejects takes so long? Well, let's probably factor out some, uh, let's say, uh, features that might contribute to it. So for instance, I tried to use the same compilers. So if there is no, let's say, LDC versus DMD thing going on. Uh, secondly, there are some uh, fundamental things. So regular expression pattern takes some time to compile. So it has time to prepare. Like say, Boyermo search has time to prepare for searching. So fundamentally, it has a good, let's say, opportunity to run faster. Uh, secondly, uh, Specialized string search may be faster if you take time to tune it. So there must be some tricks beyond uh, what I just shown, beyond, beyond the VM execution. So let's take a look at them. Well, the first simple trick that every regular expression library does is they, they take a look at the first character in the pattern, and if it happens to be a fixed character, then they just call mancar. And then, after they found the first character, they run the full VM loop. This is simple. It's, a, uh, it's uh, the only portable way to have a fast, uh, let's say, fast search for a byte. There's nothing portable outside of that. Uh, if you go beyond that, you can say that, OK, uh, if a uh, regular expression starts with a fixed uh, substring, then I can, can use uh, some string search algorithms, like, say, Boyer Moore, or maybe horse pool search or maybe some other variation of that. And some engines ex uh, indeed do that. Uh, admittedly, this standard library doesn't do this. And the reason I didn't choose this way is because, well, after all, regular expressions are not fixed strings, right? We have to get some more flexibility of using them. So there's no point in speeding up only fixed searches. And what I realized is that some patterns are somewhat fixed, especially if you consider uh, case-insensitive matching. It basically turns every fixed pattern into semi-fixed pattern. So you look for character A and you look for capital A at the same time. So there, you goes, there goes your optimization for memcar at front of pattern. And this led me, me to believe that there must be some fuzzy searching tricks that may allow me to search faster. And indeed, I found out uh, let's say, simple and robust and, uh, uh, let's say, well-understood algorithm that's called uh, Shift-Or. 
It's a bit parallel NFA simulation, in fact. Uh, it has some great qualities, like it's uh, linear time search. It, uh, uh, it's ready amendable to fuzzy searching, so it can search for things like, say, simple character classes. And it's even faster than DFA. Uh, so basically, the go-to thing to you know, match strings, like, say, uh, a hookahastic search that, d that constructs DFA. And there is a problem with that. So as defined, it doesn't work with UTF, so I had to do that some tricks to tweak it, and it turns out that it became less accurate. But for our purposes it will do, because we just like start, we just find the likely starting point, and then launch the full VM machine. And the great result is that this brings uh, search performance something like 10 times than it was before, or maybe 20 times, it depends on your pattern. Okay, so, uh, Let's probably get to the specific point. Uh, <clears throat> so what we have in D is a modern regular expression library. Uh, it was uh, made as a part of Google Summer of Code 2011. The basic goals were to have all the extensions that people are used to, like uh, unlimited lookarounds, like uh, named captures and whatnot. Uh, it has to support Unicode because, well, Unicode is the future. There is no point in supporting legacy encodings that are still going, let's say, the way of Dodo. <coughs> and it implements both schemes that I just showed you. And it uses short-term trick to speed up matching. And it doesn't have JIT compiler, so sorry about that. And, uh, well, but it still stays portable, you know. Uh, and it has some unique features like static rejects, and we'll get to that later. Uh, and it does it in something like eight kilobytes of decode. Oh, so let's uh, take a peek at what uh, is behind the, what happens behind the scenes. So first of all, it's compilation phase. Uh, the key uh, feature here to take away is that we try hard not to redo the job that we have to do. Say, if we have seen this pattern before, we just pick it from the pattern cache and use as is. Now, if that fails, we have to repass the pattern, but if, uh, say, it reuses the same char uh, character set that we've seen before, we just take the other structures for them and reuse that. And there's a bit of analysis step to say if we can use shift or tweaks or if we can't use that. So if it's semi-fixed or not. Uh, so here's the matching phase. And it can be viewed as kind of uh, let's say, multi-layered multi filter architecture. So we start with the most coarse one, that's memcar, for instance, that is the most coarse, rep coarse representation of a button at hand with basically one character. If it matches, then we took something more sophisticated, let's say shift or. Shift or would represent uh, a prefix of our regular expression. And if that matches, then we run full-blown virtual machine. And if that matches, well, we found the match, so we are done here. And as you can see, each step can fall back to the previous one. So if we can't uh, find a string using shift or, we fall back to car, and we search for the first character I knew. Well, some of that might not be applicable, and uh, actually I think it's a good future direction to make this pipeline more representable in the code, because today it's rather monolithic. Uh, you know, it's kind of high-level overview because looking at the code, you probably won't ever figure out how these pieces fit together. So maybe with a bit of uh, refactoring, we can make this all combinatorics all more explicit. Maybe it reduce more steps. Okay, uh, what makes D so, let's say, pleasant or, uh, uh, say, efficient in writing regular expressions? Uh, well, since I talked about virtual machines at the start, uh, what do virtual machines look like? They look like, uh, let's say, bytecode interpreters. And the good thing, for instance, that I love absolutely about D is ability to bind functions and values to constants. In this case, constants are bytecode uh, upcodes, uh, upcodes. 
And for instance, here is a simple, simple function, right? It calculates the amount of uh, parameters that the current opcode has. So for instance, character has one, uh, one, par uh, one value that basically says which character it is. Character sets have exactly one parameter. And some more complex extractions, like say, uh, look ahead and whatever. They may have more parameters. So this is a simple runtime function. And what I want to do with it is that I want to uh, execute at compile time and bind the result statically to the opcodes. And here's a trick to do that. It's called eponymous template. And here's the line. So after a, a bit of tinkering, we can use exactly uh, the same function to generate compile time constants. Well, say in C or C++, I would have to use some external generator or some other tool to get there. And it's, let's say, pretty handy. So it's just one liner, and, and there is no boilerplate. So for instance, in C++, I might have to do, let's say, template meta programming that will involve a lot of extra lines and will involve, involve re-implementing this function separately. OK, uh, the second trick, and this one is probably in the expressiveness department. So what I, huh, let's say, I call English expressive if I can have two pieces of code that do uh, semantically equivalent things, and if I can find a way to rewrite it in such a way that I have one piece that does a common job of these two, then I say it's expressive. So here's the challenge, let's say. Uh, like I said, we are talking about virtual machines. So here's the dispatch loop on the left. Well, typical crappy code that is usually a switch statement that spans a couple of uh, pages. And we have two, uh, two, two switch statements like that because we have two ways to execute virtual machine. And what to note here is that there are a lot of uh, identical code. Like say, if a character equals to one stored in a uh, starts in a pattern, then we advance thread forward. If it doesn't, we fail and we drop thread. And it happens the same way for both machines, semantically. Now, how do we pack this up? Uh, and Deep allows for so-called, let's say, uh, static for each. Stat what for static for each does is that it allows you to insert a uh, bunch of code, a uh, bunch of parameterized code in a current uh, statement scope. So, he, so we just list atoms and then we spin through each atom. The instruction gets the current value. And this code generates exactly the same thing that on the left. But you just see one representation of it. There is no need to, you know, uh, actually copy and paste things around. So the bottom line is that we get the same C switch statement, but there is no less code. Less code means dry code, less bugs, and whatever. OK. Uh, we are getting to the unique feature of D. And uh, <coughs> uh, one thing we always wanted about uh, regular expressions is performance. So regular expressions we usually write when we want to get a job d done quickly. So we say, uh, write uh, some patterns and we apply it to text and we get results. And we just sort of throw it away. But when, then later it comes time to make it uh, run faster and you would have to rewrite the same code in your, with your say, in your favorite language, let's say in D. And <laughs> Uh, what we always wanted is to just, you know, flip a switch and say, okay, these patterns are fixed. We know ahead, ahead of time what the patterns are. Let them run faster. Let them compile to native code. And uh, what we have in D is uh, basically pretty much the same. Uh, the only change is uh, four characters. Uh, sorry about that. And the rest four applies. So we get uh, new native speed. And and that's it, let's see. 
I think uh, the promise about writing written by hand is a little bit uh, presumptuous, but it's as good as if written by hand, let's say. So here's some results. Uh, this is so-called rejects DNA benchmark. It's, uh, let's say, I haven't designed this benchmark. I took it from the computer language shootout, popular uh, language comparison toolkit. And what it does, it uh, searches for a number of patterns in uh, DNA. Well, DNA is uh, uh, something like uh, half a gigabyte of A, T, G, C, and so on uh, characters. And uh, by counting up matches of a pattern and say, okay, this is monkey, or maybe this is, um, this is uh, say, human, and this is, say, tuna fish. Uh, so what we have here, uh, the most, uh, let's say, the fastest regular expression engine is uh, yellow bar, and we normalized everything to it. And this is JavaScript V8 that uses JIT compiler behind the scenes. Uh, here you can find PCRE, RIA2, this is famous Google engine, Google's engine. And just for comparison, there is a Java version of it. And uh, the first two bars is this standard library. So the first one is runtime version, the second one is compile time version. So basically the change is CT rejects versus rejects. Uh, what you can see is that static version gives us about two and a half times performance against the runtime version in this particular case. More than that, it gives us and puts us ahead of the state of the art regular expression engine by 50% or something like that. And you can download and check it for yourself. It's all on GitHub. Uh, and here's some, let's say, more dubious results. Uh, this is a test that I prepared myself. It contains three patterns, three different class of patterns, let's say. Uh, uh, so what to take away from this is that uh, each engine has its, uh, let's say, uh, weak points, like say Ray2 that does amazingly a good job on URLs, but it's a poor fit for Wikilink. And that JIT compilers actually do uh, do show some promise. You know. uh, one thing to note here is that, uh, uh, say, PCI and Boost C++ reject libraries I had to disable UTF processing because they were too slow with it. Like, some, say, 10 times slow, 20 times slow. They won't even show up. Uh, let's take a peek on orange bars, maybe. Uh, what we see is that we're still uh, somewhere in the top. And uh, importantly, the improvements uh, range from, say, five times faster to a couple, uh, 50% faster than the runtime version. And uh, maybe it's time to just you know, walk through the steps that get us there. And uh, what we need to do to get uh, compile time rejects is that we just need to generate D code based on a pattern and then put it inside of a, a function as if it was written there before. So we run the same exact pattern as runtime version. We walk the bytecode and generate pieces of code, and then we you know, do a minor trick and put this code with mixing statement. But the most important point here is that user interface should stay as is. Okay, so compile time parsing. This is something that sounds uh, pretty impossible if you think, say, C++. But for D, this is a matter of changing a couple of characters again. So just to test things, I put static instead of auto in front of uh, rejects statement, and it got compiled. So what's the difference between the two statements? Uh, on the first statement, the uh, rejects function is called at runtime. On the second statement, this, fu this function is never called. Instead, uh, raise just points to a static, uh, static variable. So. That got me actually quite hilarious. I thought, well, a couple of days and I will get this thing working. Uh, 
In fact, uh, things were much more gloomier back then. Compiler wasn't quite ready, so the, <laughs> the harder patterns I tried, the worse results I get back. So I filed bug after bug for compiler. And there's some you know, history that still shows. So I come across things like that in D standard library still uh, in this model. And it shows, let's say, uh, a workaround. Uh, maybe it's too polite, but. OK, back then, the things like, say, insert a couple of items into an array at a given index didn't work at compile time. But if you make a teeny workaround by using the so-called pseudo variable uh, CTFE, you can switch uh, between runtime mode and CT compile time mode. And in compile time mode, you do something more simple. Let's say concatenate pieces together instead of trying to insert them and be clever about it. So this no longer applies. So things are much, much better this day. And speaking of uh, generating code, uh, generation actually isn't hard at all. So we just walk the byte code. More than that, we have already done uh, the generation part while writing the virtual machine matcher. So we have this code already, just uh, sits in different switch cases. So we pick this as a starting point. Then we replace uh, dynamic parameters with compile time values. And the whole program gets turned into a switch statement. Well, like I said, it's not exactly what you'd write by hand, but it's pretty, let's say, easy to understand. Uh, what's important here is that we never do any dispatching here. So unlike on the previous slides, there is no switch on a bytecode, uh, on opcode. Instead, we just follow through for the switch state for the case statements, and the only way we actually get back to the switch is we are backtracking. So every time a thread fails, we'll get to the beginning of the switch and switch to the right instruction. Uh, the good thing about this is while I was struggling with the parser, uh, I could basically test this stuff uh, like a normal runtime runtime generator because compile time function evaluation works with the same uh, functions as the runtime evaluation works. And, you know, the last step. So we have code generated and we have parser run at compile time and generate our patterns, our bytecode. And now we have to glue together these pieces. And uh, the, the key to that is a mixing statement. So here's a teeny example. Uh, this while loop will use the x statement that we introduced with the static string. And well, in our case, it's a little bit more complicated. So we create a template uh, that uh, takes a matcher as a parameter. Matcher is uh, basically an engine, one of the two. And we paste inside whatever we just generated out of this uh, virtual, uh, out of this uh, pattern. And the last missing piece is uh, hacking our way through the code. So, you know, we just introduce a compile time parameter that says, OK, use uh, generated function, or no, use the interpreter loop. So this is matching for the core loop inside of um, uh, a regular expression matcher. OK. Uh, this is the last piece. Uh, and here's what it looks exactly in the standard library. So I took this uh, place of piece of code verbatim. And here's the whole step indicated. It's actually from the, let's say, uh, working code. So it's one to one. There's no simplification. And the here you see the first step. So we say enum r equals ajax pattern flags. This does the compilation step. The next one does the source generation, source code generation. And here's a couple of uh, helper aliases that just, you know, uh, make things shorter, Sh sort of uh, short hands. Then goes our generated function, where we need the source code. And the last line is uh, packing it all together. So we pack uh, data structures that are used together with the expression and the function that we just generated. 
And the last step is actually what makes this all pleasant to look at. And it's a template uh, exactly like I showed before. So this is eponymous template trick. It binds, in this case, it binds, let's say, computation and function code, functions that we just generated to a CTRJX name. So that was all that it took to implement compile time regular expressions. Uh, and here's some final thoughts on this experiment, let us, let's say that. Uh, first of all, there are some limitations to it. So for instance, uh, since it's compiled time variable expression, you have to pick uh, patterns ahead of time. There is no runtime input. There is no I.O. Uh, secondly, I haven't even begun to realize all potential optimizations that are present here. So just like I said, I just replaced uh, dynamic parameters with compile time known values. Uh, secondly, uh, there is a question of co cause bloat. Since for each pattern we generate a function, then you know if you have something like 400 patterns or maybe 1,000 patterns, that must generate a lot of object code. And then there is, of course, a question of uh, compiler quality, let's say. And, let's, and like it was told before, Mixing statement makes compile times much, much longer. Since we use exactly that, you know, can imagine that it takes a lot of time. So for instance, just you know, to give a figure, it takes something like uh, five minutes and uh, three gigabytes of RAM to run uh, standard library tests. And, it, and it's only just a subset of all tests for your expression library. So I usually do something like five runs each time I'm running a separate subset of full test suite, uh, because otherwise it will just blow my memory usage out and terminate without of memory, by the way. <laughs> uh, what's more importantly is that uh, debugging things that run into com at, at compile time is quite hard. So for instance, there's no I not even printf available that while stuff is running at compile time. And well, personally, I would love some kind of debugger for compile time evaluation. Maybe in include it into compiler, I don't know, actually. <laughs> well, printf would be epsom at compile time. I think there is was a pull request for CTFE, write ln, or maybe something like that. Yes? Uh, no, it doesn't work. Uh, the thing about pragma message is that it uh, prints uh, compile time values, like say enum, right? And, and then say you have a function that is evaluated at compile time. Uh, the parameters are variables, like say int a, int b, or whatever. And while you execute this function, you don't know that they are constant, right? right. Yeah, they happen to be constant at the very end. But while it executed, while you executed this, you think it's just you know runtime code. This is a bad thing about it. So if you can say hack up uh, right to land to you know, speed something as the compile time, it will be great. Well, and of course, uh, compiler should stop probably leaking memory <laughs> like crazy. That would help a lot. Okay, well, uh, I got to that slide a little bit faster than I'd like to, but maybe we can go back if you'd like to ask some question about, say, uh, evaluation strategies and whatnot. So we have more time for question, maybe more time for question. So one moment, uh, just let me uh, say, uh, go through some of these points. This is the last slide. So the major goal that I have uh, for C going forward with this regular expression library, and there are roughly four uh, major areas. Uh, the first is flexibility. So, you know, like I said, Unicode is the future and whatnot, but people love using uh, regular expressions for uh, ASCII texts or for say uh, byte level manipulation. And in fact, I was reading a lot of papers and they all use regular expressions for packet filters and stuff like that. So there's slow row bytes. And secondly, uh, I think that we ought to work on something like say, uh, let's say, uh, <coughs> make static rejects uh, more optimized, so we should generate more efficient code because we know uh, the exact uh, consequences, let's say, 
if you know that a uh, character class includes only two characters or maybe 10 characters, you can just inline all of them. And I think that things like that will be useful for efficient lexer generators. And I think some, somebody was working on lexer generators. Maybe there can be some kind of library that unites the two. So kind of STD meta tool or STD, let's say, text, or STD text meta. And secondly, expressiveness. I think that we all see, uh, say, impenetrable, <laughs> impenetrable rejects patterns. And one reason they are also, let's say, uh, hard to look upon is that uh, there is no way to avoid repetition. So say if you s define a piece of pattern that matches any integer between 0 and 255, let's say IP address, right? Then there is no way but to repeat it four times. And this makes the thing less maintainable than it should be by definition. So I think some BNF, BNF style user defined atoms may help a lot with that. And then there is so-called scanf on steroids. It's basically if you have a pattern matched against the text, then you have all the sub matches. Then the next logical step is to apply a bit of post-processing to convert uh, text uh, into integers and whatnot. And uh, switch-like switch pattern, this is something like uh, that language like Ruby has built in. So the switches accept uh, regular expressions as case statements. And I think there is a pull request that does just this for our regular expression library, and it waits on, well, on me, but also on uh, <coughs> a bit of infrastructure to make it more feasible, let's say. And uh, lately, uh, lastly, <laughs> security and stability. Uh, like I said, for instance, that uh, backtracking engines could take exponential amount of time, or near exponential, super polynomial. Uh, there is an opportunity for attackers to say, uh, call the denial of service and whatnot. So some applications like, say, database engines and uh, search engines would love to limit the visibilities of different operators and regular expression patterns. And I think there should be ways to do that. And secondly, maybe embedded systems, maybe they just want to drop a lot of features to save on code space. So there are use cases for that as well. And lastly, oh, okay, a second time, lastly, and uh, performance. Well, there's no such thing as uh, good enough performance. Uh, there's always push for more. And speaking about uh, compile time regular expressions, we haven't even started uh, to, uh, let's say, use it to full. Uh, full potential. And uh, I think that technically it should beat any JIT compiled version simply because unlike JIT compiler, we have full-blown compiler with all those optimizations and all the time to do them. So there is potential to beat everything else. Uh, also, there is a lot of low-hanging fruit in the engine itself. Like I said, for instance, in infrastructure for defining, uh, let's say, uh, stages or filters, like, like memcar filter that searches for the first character, and maybe more. And lastly, there is a ways always to extend on shift or trick. So I think there may be more interesting things in, in this direction, like say, uh, let's say, uh, combining Boyer Moore and uh, Fuzzy searching. I think there are seen papers like I think I seen papers that combine the two. So you have Fuzzy searching and you have uh, so-called, let's say. Uh, Turbo shift or like things like that that are characteristic to Boyer Moore. So with that, I am done. So thank you. And we have uh, 10 minutes extra for questions, but I think you. First Use round of applause, I think. Hi. Um, I'd like you to come back on the shift or trick, if that's okay. possible. Okay. That was a bit fast to me, and I didn't get it. OK. Shift or trick. Uh, which one? This? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, when you explain what is it and how that works. Uh, how it works, right? <laughs> OK, it will take, I think, uh, another 15 minutes. Or <laughs> let's okay, say. Just make it fast, brother. OK, uh, to put things simply, uh, uh, shift or 
search is a kind of uh, fuzzy search, string search that uh, is, uh, let's say, uh, modeled on emulating an AFA. So you construct a non-deterministic state automation. Uh, for fixed things, it's going to be something simple, like say A, B, C, and so on, simple states. And if it's a fuzzy string search, then you have A or B, A or C, and whatnot combined. Now you have this simple automation that goes linear, right? And what Shiftor does, it encodes every bit of a word, let's say 32 bits or less, okay, <coughs> 32 bits is old, 64 bit. So each uh, state is represented by, by one bit in a word. Now, uh, the trick is to evaluate every state of this machine, like a simple shift. So you do a bit shift and every state moves along then you apply a mask. A mask that indicates each character set. So you apply a mask and you actually do something like uh, 64 matches at a time for each state. Then the ones that uh, do not match fall out and you continue moving on. And the trick here is that to use uh, zero as an active state. Then you don't have to do anything with the first state. It's always zero when you shift. Well, something like that. <laughs> well, actually it took me something like a week to understand it and I think I implemented it before I understand it. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Well, we actually have some uh, plenty of stuff on the live stream. Okay. Uh, firstly, some e-claps from the uh, live stream. They want to say thanks for an awesome library that uh, really shows off D in its best light. So. Uh, Thought I'd pass that on for you, um, but we do we do have some questions, and uh, uh, one of them was, um, you know, are there any advantages of using a runtime engine, uh, even if the, uh, the pattern is known ahead of time, compile time? Uh, could you repeat, please? I'm just going to quote literally. Okay. So, uh, are there any advantages in using runtime regex <laughs> engine, even if the pattern is known at compile time? Uh, well, one big advantage is. Uh, compile times. So if you iterate on your program and you don't want to spend something like a couple of minutes every time you recompile, well, I think using runtime version is good. Uh, I think actually using runtime is the best choice until the very end, you know, until the point where you want to, uh, say, impress your customer with excellent timings and whatnot. <laughs> so before that, just use runtime version. It's more tested, by the way. <laughs> it's only recently that I let's say, crawled through the whole unit test for compile time regular expressions because it took, so, took a lot of time. And it also took some time to find the right partitioning of the unit test so that it doesn't fail. Uh, we also have a question actually about uh, debugging. What's the best way to debug <laughs> CTFE in your opinion? Hmm? What's the, way, the best way to debug? <laughs> uh, so what's the best way to debug uh, compile time function evaluation? Uh, and uh, here's a tricky point. Uh, what do you want to debug, a compiler or <laughs> your own code, you know? Because uh, it turns out that most of the time I was debugging a compiler, actually. So what's the best way to do this? Well, I think the best way is to try to split up your function in some, you know, manageable chunks, and at each step uh, com uh, compare this this run, say, to the runtime version. And the moment you find some strange things going on, like say, well, insert into array, produce some sudden zeros inside of array, just out of blue. So this kind of stuff to watch out. And the moment you have it, you just need to you know, reduce it and file the bug. <laughs> if you want to debug your own code, <laughs> uh, well, I suggest to just start with runtime version. It's much safer to debug runtime versions and then go to compile time. And you can go back and forth at will. There's no problem. All right. I think unless we have any other questions, uh, we should give ourselves a five-minute break until the next session. And again, thank you very much indeed, Dmitry.